Good afternoon. Welcome to Invest in America Small Business Tools and Resource Webinar. We will be getting started in just a brief moment. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Again, thank you so much for joining us today, Invest in America Small Business Tools and Resources, an SBA and Public Private Strategies Institute webinar as part of our series. We're going to do a little housekeeping before we get started today. Just want to remind everyone that if you have questions, to please use the Q&A function located on your Zoom here. And then also the U.S. Small Business Administration does not endorse Public Private Strategies Institute. This session is being recorded and also live streamed on Facebook on the SBA and PPSI page. And we ask that you please do not share any personal information in the Q&A function. We also wanna thank all our amazing partners for making this possible today. So thank you to all of those listed here. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Meredith Schaefer, who is the principal here at Public Private Strategies. Thank you so much, Renee. Uh, grateful to be here today and to have each of you on the line for this important SBA webinar, Invest in America Small Business Tools and Resources. Today, we'll be discussing the Biden-Harris administration's groundbreaking U.S. national strategy to counter anti-Semitism, which was announced in May of this year. Prior to beginning the content for the webinar, we'd like to take a moment of silence for the recent terrorist attacks in Israel and the worsening humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other forms of hate affect us all, and together we can work toward a more inclusive and equitable future. Through the national strategy, the Biden administration has developed important tools to curb discrimination based on shared ancestry or ethnic characteristics, and to better protect the civil rights of all Americans. Today on this webinar, we'll be sharing more about these protections and the administration's commitment to raising awareness, protecting communities, and building cross-community solidarity. You'll hear from representatives from both the SBA and the EEOC about their training and resources for small business owners and employees on preventing and responding to anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and related forms of hate. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dan Krupnik, counselor to the administration, counselor to the administrator of the U.S. Small Business Administration. Mr. Krupnik previously served with the SBA during the Obama administration and now serves as counselor to the administrator, where he works to promote the priority initiatives of the administrator and the Biden-Harris administration. Prior to returning to the SBA, Dan worked with the Connecticut State Treasurer as Chief of Staff and Assistant Treasurer for Policy. While with the State Treasurer's Office, he worked on the Responsible Gun Policy Initiative, as well as the Treasurer's Corporate Call to Action. Dan, please take us away. Meredith, thank you for that introduction. <clears throat> I wanna thank PPSI, for helping us facilitate today's webinar. Uh, my name is Dan Krupnik and I am counselor to the administrator here at the SBA. Part of my responsibilities include being the lead staffer working on the president's national strategy to counter anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other forms of hate. At the SBA, we know that many small businesses are not only family owned, but feel like families. Over the last few weeks, many have been impacted by the terror attack by Hamas in Israel. Yesterday, the president was in Israel to meet with families that were impacted by the attack and reaffirm America's commitment to them. As the voice of 33 million small businesses, last year, the SBA was asked to join an interagency policy committee to help with the formation of the Biden-Harris National Strategy. The SBA will be front and center with assisting small business owners to help understand what responsibilities they have to their employees, as well as provide training and resources to small business owners. After the announcement of the strategy in May, Administrator Isabel Guzman announced the first of its kind alliance with the American Jewish Committee. 
This agreement, signed by the administrator and former Congressman Ted Deutsch, shares that the SBA and the AJC will provide training on anti-Semitism and re resources to small business owners and members of the AJC community. The SBA is working to sign more of those agreements in the coming year, and we will have more information about those in the future. Today, the SBA, along with PPSI, are hosting our first training for small businesses to assist them to counter hate in their businesses and in their communities. We are joined by an amazing resource, the Equal Opportunity, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The EEOC is responsible for enforcing federal laws that make it illegal to discriminate against a job applicant or an employee. Today, the EEOC and Zach Florent are joining us to help small businesses better understand the landscape on discrimination and to be a resource for you and your businesses. I'm very glad that Zach and the EEOC are able to join us for this first and incredibly important training and want to share my thanks with him and the EEOC team for joining us. I also want to thank Ron Spencer, who you will hear from from the SBA, for joining us to provide some additional resources that our agency has. Finally, I want to thank all of you for also joining us today. At the SBA, we believe part of our mission is to provide current and thoughtful resources for small businesses across the country. Meredith, back to you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Zach Florent. He is the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Seattle Field Office of the EEOC, serving the states of Alaska, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington. A Midwest native, he attended Ball State University and previously worked as a senior investigator with EEOC's Chicago District Office. He's an experienced trainer on a variety of EEO topics, including harassment prevention, reasonable accommodations, EEO investigations, and LGBTQI plus cultural sensitivity. Mr. Florent also serves as a board member for the agency's LGBTQI affinity group, EEOC Pride. Zach, over to you. Great. Thank you, Meredith. Um, and I just want to start off by saying uh, thank you to both the SBA and PPSI for um, having us here today. Um, I'll take just a little pause while my slides get going here. Um, for those of you who um, are maybe unfamiliar, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is the federal agency that enforces the nation's um, laws that prohibit workplace discrimination. I forgot to also mention, um, my name is Zach, I use he, him pronouns, and if you need a visual description, I'm a white guy with brown kind of salt pepper hair, um, glasses, a beard, and I'm wearing a blue shirt and a gray jacket. Um, next slide, please. So as I said, EEOC is the, the federal agency that enforces the nation's laws that prohibit discrimination in the workplace. Uh, we were founded out of the civil rights movement of the 1960s after the historic March on Washington that happened in 63, uh, that was 60 years ago. Um, the Civil Rights Act was passed in 64, and we opened our doors in 1965. Our mission is to promote equal employment opportunities through things like this, outreach and education, uh, compliance and voluntary settlement of charges of discrimination, and when necessary, we have the ability to take uh, employers that are violating the law to federal court. Uh, our fundamental philosophy at the EEOC is that everyone has the right to work in a place that's free from harassment and discrimination. It's an employer's responsibility to ensure their workers can enjoy these rights by taking steps to prevent harassment and discrimination and to encourage employees to use resources to report harassment discrimination when it occurs and respond promptly to those complaints and take appropriate action where an issue has been found. So on the slide right now, you can see the different bases that are covered under federal anti-discrimination law. So we have race, color, national origin, religion, sex, which includes gender identity, sexual orientation, and pregnancy, genetic information, age, 40 and older, and disability. Now, for the purpose of this uh, meeting, I'd like to zoom in on religion uh, for a moment. So discrimination based on religion uh, is illegal. 
the government isn't in the practice of telling people what is or is not a religion. So the standard that we use is a sincerely held religious, ethical, or moral belief. So this, for example, would include those who identify as Jewish or followers of Islam. Um, this coverage also extends to people who might be perceived to be followers of a particular religion, uh, people who are associated with individuals who follow a particular religion, and individuals who are non-religious. Furthermore, um, the law covers, uh, the law requires covered employers to provide religious accommodations unless doing so causes an undue hardship. So an example of a religious accommodation might be modifying a work schedule to accommodate religious observances or exceptions to things like dress codes or grooming practices for certain types of garments or, or other religious practices. National origin may also be relevant to this discussion, and, and this has to do with discrimination because a person or their family is from a particular country or part of the world because of things like ethnicity or accent, or because they appear to be part of a certain ethnic background, even though even if they are uh, not in factually of that background. National origin discrimination can also involve treating people unfavorably because they're married to, for example, or associated with a person of a particular national origin. Coverage under our laws can also be intersectional. So for example, Jewish people from Israel who are treated less favorably than Jewish people from the US, uh, that could be considered discrimination based both on national origin and religion. Next slide, please. So there's four broad categories of how discrimination can sort of manifest itself in the workplace. Unfair treatment, and, and these are, should probably feel pretty familiar to most people, things like uh, hiring or termination decisions, unfair wages, uh, promotions, demotions, or other sorts of terms and conditions of employment. Um, one thing that we often see as well would be, would be things like taking customer preference into consideration when, you know, deciding who's going to be assigned to what particular client or customer or whatever. Um, that kind of customer preference based on discriminatory lines is, is illegal under our laws. So in addition to unfair treatment, harassment is also prohibited under our laws. You can think of harassment as being uh, something that causes a, a hostile work environment. So uh, you can think of that as being, you know, uh, when your work environment becomes no longer safe, either physically safe or psychologically safe because of the treatment that you're enduring. When that treatment or harassment is connected to one of those protected categories, that's going to be illegal. Uh, there's two broad types of harassment, um, hostile work environment harassment. Uh, the first type is severe. So that's the kind of thing where uh, one incident, one time happens is going to forever ruin that person's ability to feel safe in that workplace. The other type is pervasive harassment. This is the sort of treatment that in maybe one instance isn't that big of a deal, you can brush it off. But it's the idea that over time, it gradually erodes a person's sense of safety in the workplace. Day in, day out comments all the time. Um, that's the sort of idea when we get into uh, pervasive harassment. Um, we also have failure to provide reasonable accommodations. And this is for three of our categories, disabilities, pregnancy, and that includes pregnancy-related medical conditions um, for folks who are trying to become pregnant, are pregnant, or who are recovering from childbirth. And lastly, religion, as I mentioned a moment ago. And finally, retaliation is a big one. This is the number one thing people complain to EEOC about. Retaliation has to do with an employer punishing somebody for utilizing their, their right to complain about discrimination. Uh, employers need to be especially vigilant, not just uh, retaliation from managers, but also retaliation from things like coworkers or customers. Next slide, please. So uh, on this screen is an idea of what our jurisdiction is, who, who we cover, who we have authority to investigate. Um, for the most part, it's all employers. The, the big exception would be federal employees. We're covered under a different law. Um, private employers, educational institutions, labor organizations, joint labor management, apprenticeship and training committees, um, employee employment agencies, and state and local governments are all covered under our statutes. Who can file? Uh, the key thing is there has to be an employee-employer relationship. So that could be a current employee, a temp worker, somebody who's applying for a job, someone who was a recent employee, a former employee. And this also includes people who are undocumented. I'm going to pause on that for just a moment. 
Um, the laws that we enforce uh, do not do not consider documentation status to be of relevance in any way, shape, or form. So uh, if you are undocumented, if you're not undocumented, that's not relevant for us. What's relevant for us is whether or not the discrimination occurred. I'm going to pause just for a moment while the other interpreter gets ready. And while we're waiting here, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, we're good to go. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. All right. So these are some other uh, considerations to think about with respect to our jurisdiction. As I mentioned on the last slide, there has to be an employee-employer relationship. After all, it's right in the name of the agency, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. There's also a minimum number of employees uh, for us to be able to have jurisdiction. For most types of discrimination, we're talking about 15 or more employees. If we're talking about age discrimination, it's a different law, and that category uh, of discrimination requires 20 or more employees. Lastly, if we're talking about uh, sex-based discrimination limited to pay, limited to pay, wages, and benefits, we only need one person. Again, that's a separate law, the Equal Pay Act, and we only need one current employee and somebody to compare them to, either a previous employee or a former or uh, the next employee. There's also a, a time frame that you need to file a charge by. Uh, in the law, it's 180 days from whenever the most recent harm occurred. However, in many states, uh, states with what we call Fair Employment Practice Agencies or FEPA, um, those states, people working in those states have 300 days to file a charge, counting from the date of the most recent alleged harm. Again, because the Equal Pay Act is different, there's a different uh, timeliness structure. For that sort of charge, you need two or three years from the most recent, uh, recent harm. And this deadline isn't impacted by filing a charge. And in fact, with EPA, you can go straight to court. So that's a, a super duper brief overview of what EEOC does. Can we go to the next slide? Um, I wanna just talk about some pro tips for employers to think about. So uh, number one, be proactive. You know, uh, Problems are easiest to manage when they are small. So fight harassment by really cultivating a culture that, that empowers employees to talk about their issues, to address them right away while they are still small and manageable. Make sure managers and supervisors are present and available to employees. Make sure they understand their roles. Make sure they're well-trained on civil rights laws and make sure they know what their responsibilities to employees are, particularly as it comes to prohibiting discrimination and protecting them from harassment at work. It's important that your policies around this stuff make sense to people, that they use plain language um, for, so people can understand how to recognize, report, respond to complaints of harassment, discrimination, and retaliation. The next one is effective complaint procedures, effective being the key word there. It's all fine and good if you have, you know, somebody to file a complaint to, but if that doesn't, if that doesn't cause any action, if that process doesn't work, people won't utilize it. People won't let you know when there's a problem, and so you won't be able to take action to correct it. And then lastly, prompt appropriate and effective remedial action taken in response where there's been an issue found. All three of those things are required, prompt, appropriate, and effective. And lastly, I just want to note that be mindful that the attacks on Israel and the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, um, that may flare up incidents of uh, anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, including in the workplace. Employers right now should be especially vigilant for backlash discrimination in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Um, we encourage you and encourage your employees to report anti-Semitic and other sort of hate incidents to the proper authorities. That could mean filing an EEO complaint with your state FIPA or your local FIPA or EEOC um, as appropriate or contacting lo local law enforcement or the FBI if anything rises to the level of an imminent threat of violence. Um, lastly, if you enjoy QR codes, next slide, please. I have a bunch coming up for you. Um, this is also gonna be in the materials we'll send out later and they'll, they'll be clickable in those materials if you don't love QR codes. 
Um, but we've got a link first to our small business resource center, a bunch of material, bunch of information for small businesses to use to help make sure they understand their responsibilities and understand what we do. Um, we've also got a brief fact sheet about uh, for small businesses written in 30 different languages. And the third one to the right there is uh, the contact information for all of the small business liaisons across the country for EEOC. People like myself um, who are available to answer emails, answer phone calls about your questions about the laws that we enforce. Um, we also do free training for small businesses. Next slide, please. Now, as part of uh, the effort of the Biden administration, we developed this uh, this document here, our fact sheet on anti-Semitism. Um, you can find that on our website or, again, by scanning the QR code or clicking it in the materials you receive later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I believe, uh, yeah, so this is my second to last QR code. Uh, this is the required poster that all employers need to put uh, in a place that their employees can access and read. This is the Know Your Rights poster, has all of the information for your employees about what their rights are in the workplace. And the next slide. The EEOC has 15 districts and 53 offices nationwide. Uh, this is a map to give you an idea of what our coverage looks like. To find your local office, you can use that QR code right there on the screen, or you can click on it in your materials. Um, find your local office, find your small business liaison um, through that way uh, as well. Uh, next slide, please. I think that's it for me. Um, I wanna again, thank you, uh, say thanks to the Small Business Association um, for inviting us here today. Um, I'll be hanging out in the Q&A um, area after this. So if you have questions, feel free to use that tool. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Zach. And uh, again, as Zach mentioned, we will be sending materials out after this presentation. So uh, you can, get some of those QR codes and other information um, in writing shortly after this ends. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ron Spencer. Ron is a senior advisor with the SBA's Office of Field Operations. He joined SBA in 2020, and he's worked on PPP, COVID, IDLE, RRF, and SVOG. He brings over 35 years of private sector experience to the SBA, He's currently working on the urban underserved markets and is exploring strategies for improving access to the many programs that SBA offers. Ron is also evaluating ways to utilize SBA's resource partner uh, network, and he is also SBA's faith-based center point of contact. His experience during his private sector career included global and government affairs at the local, state, and federal levels, operations, and grassroots engagements. Ron, turning it over to you. Uh, thank you so, so very much, uh, Meredith. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon and a big thank you to all the small business owners and those that are aspiring to become entrepreneurs for joining this important webinar. Thank you for your contributions to our economy and our annual perseverance. My intentions today is to share some information and ideas that will provide you some uh, actionable items that will increase your awareness of the SBA available resources. As was mentioned, I am uh, the center of uh, faith-based uh, point of contact for SBA, and I work closely with the Biden-Harris administration's uh, Office of Faith-Based and Community Partnerships, which is headed up by Melissa Rogers. SBA has signed, as was mentioned by Dan earlier, a strategic alliance memorandum with the American Jewish Committee, and we're also in discussions with the Latter-day Saints in Utah to develop a similar strategic alliance memorandum. And that gives us an opportunity to partner with and really raise to the next level and increase the awareness of the resource partners that are available free of charge to all of you out there that are, that are participating in this webinar. We have the score group, which that comprised of retired executives that have very diverse backgrounds that could help in any way as you start your business, as you scale your business, or even as you prepare to take steps to protect your business. We have the women's business centers. We have the veterans business outreach centers. 
And so the list goes on and on of the resources that we have, and we just encourage each of you to take advantage of those. In addition to those research partners, uh, we encourage you to connect with community leaders, the Chamber of Commerce, business associations, and alliances, and again, faith-based leaders. As we all know, the faith-based and churches are really cornerstone of our communities, where there's a plethora of information you can get, and also to get some education and become more aware of what's going on. It would also be a good idea and recommendation uh, to connect with the local political leaders, even your homeowners associations where there's very diverse homeowners and the law enforcement agencies. Wherever there's an opportunity to unify, it should be explored. You should stay engaged with the law enforcement officers as well as I mentioned, and even have them speak during some of your community's uh, meetings, even come to some of your employee meetings at your job so you can increase that awareness. All, rep all incidents should be reported to the appropriate officials. And this also helps cultivate that relationships and makes you more comfortable when people are talking to law enforcement and really perceive them as our friends and not adversaries. If possible, you should have a hotline and encourage people to, your employees to uh, report those incidents. Remember what you report also helps mitigate and helps other people in their situations. Also in some cases, gives them the courage that they need. Many of you are dreaming about starting your businesses and you in fact started those businesses. And it took a lot of intestinal fortitude, a lot of courage, and a lot of resilience to get those businesses up and running. So protect that dream, protect that investment. I would also suggest being proactive to build relationships across different faiths. Building relationships in times of calm really prepares us to come together in times of needs. Here's another thought. You don't have to be a clergy person or a religious scholar a member of an advocacy group or engage to engage in bridge building across different faith communities. What about organizing or participating, participating in a unity walk that gives you a chance to uh, see how each other thinks and see the different perspectives and different opinions and in time you come to respect those. To add to what we have in terms of SBA, there are 68 office of field operations around the country. So pretty much every zip code and every uh, geographical boundaries or locations, there is a SBA resource that can help you. I would like to close by saying thank you so much for attending and my goal and I hope I left you with a takeaway that would benefit you as you move forward. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Ron. And thank you again to all of our speakers. Zach Florent, Dan Kropnik, Ron Spencer, thank you uh, in the audience for joining us today for this webinar. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Renee to close us out. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, and thank you to Meredith for moderating today's conversation. If you have any SBA-related questions, please use this email address answerdesk at sba.gov. And if you would like to receive a copy of this webinar, please feel free to contact us at events at publicprivatestrategies.com. And with that, we thank you so much for joining us today.